you have much too much too much faith. Okay. One thing I thought I would just try and show you is a little bit of difference between the Java 7 API docs and the, and the Java 8. So if you look in, in I just picked a random class, object input stream. Right, what you have are, is it broken down into, actually I should probably should have selected a, uh, an interface, but you've got nested classes, constructor section, methods, and so on. With Java 8, what you've got is the API docs broken down a little bit differently, where you can look at all methods, just the static methods, instant methods, the abstract methods, if you're wondering what that one abstract method is and you're trying to find it, and default methods, right? So it, 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 when you're looking at uh, the interfaces in, in, or the classes in JDK 8, you can actually kind of just go to API docs and if you want to go find the default method, just click on you know the default method tab. Um, or if you want to look at that one final, uh, sorry, that one abstract method, then you just click on abstract methods in, in, the, in a functional interface. Alrighty. So this is where I was going to talk about type inference. And I kind of got things a little bit out of order. But this is uh, a very simple class called person. It has a first name and a last name with getters and setters, right? So it's pretty much a simple bean, a person bean. And what uh, this class does is it actually uh, creates a list of people. And these are folks from the uh, Orange County Jug. Sorry, I didn't have time to replace it with the uh, SD Jug okay. names. And what you can do is <coughs> sort this list by calling uh, collections.sort, which is a new method. Pass in the list that you want to sort, in this case, the list of people. And the function that actually is the comparison, that actually returns a negative one if person two is less than person one, I think. Uh, a positive one if person two is greater than person one, and then zero if they're equal, right? And so what we're gonna do to do that in this case is we just pass in a um, lambda expression that basically ex uh, defines that code. Person one, and we're gonna sort by, uh, by last name in this case. And you'll notice that because we have two parameters in this lambda expression, we do have to have the parentheses. Right? And if you want to, and this is um, kind of neat because um, NetBeans is actually lambda smart, NetBeans 8 and above. So if I wanted to, I'll tell you, I'm not used to not having the types of the parameters. If I look at O2, O1 and O2, I look at this and it just doesn't, it's not as readable to me. I have to know what type people is. And we know that people is a list of persons, right? So because of that, that's how the, uh, the runtime actually infers all, these, all this type. It's sorting people, and these parameters have to be people. How do we know that? Let's go to the sort method. Because the list uh, is of T, and we're comparing of type T. So, If we go back to what the compiler does, oops, back to sort. The list is of type T, people, um, and we're, we're comparing the, that same type. So the, the compiler infers that these have to be people. And so does the IDE in this case, because I can actually use explicit parameter types, right? And it'll stick those in. To me, that's more readable uh, until I'm used to lambdas, to be honest. Um, I find this easier to read. Uh, yeah, if I try to do, um, you could have any subclass of person. So well, it depends on uh, the collection. So this says uh, super type. Oh. In this case. Um, so, to, just to give you a, a, an example of, let's see if what, what, oops, what that means. 
lost my diamond. There it is. What other options do we have? Okay. Maybe I'll go back here and show you one other neat feature. Up in that beans. And I'm sure all the IDEs will, will do this as well at some point. If we go back to the inner class example, This is an inner class. Uh, all right, maybe I'll find another example where, where, where you can take an inner class and convert it to a lambda, and that means it will automatically to do it. It's kind of a nice feature. That's just not the right example. All right, let's take a look at streams now. Before you leave sort, yes. could you show sort again? Sure. Could you? Instead, sort people by person, colon, colon, get last name. And then you probably don't want the parameters on the front. You should just right. give the reference. Oh, 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 hold on. Uh, no, 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 no. no. Does it return yeah. zero or one? Because we have to, we're, we're comparing two things, though, right? Yeah. We have to have, have both yeah. parameters. Well, you could do that if person extended the parable. <coughs> then you wouldn't need to pass anything out. Let's go back. You can just go ahead and start an at that point. Let's go back and listen to this. A list of T, this is the comparator. So what we're passing in is a, compar is a comparator function. Sorry, I'm, I'm mentally doing this here. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it, it you couldn't like do it necessarily with get last name, but if you had like a function say compare last name, you could probably do it with that. <coughs> that, was, that was happy to do is implement comparator. Well, is comparator <coughs> functional? Comparator, if we go to, sorry, let's go the long way again. Yeah, it's functional. Oh. So you could you could basically create uh, just a, a function that takes two parameters and returns. Um, yeah, that's what this does. Well, I mean, if if you that's wanted you wanted to use a method reference, does. so if you had oh. like a function called compare last name, then, oh. then you could do it as a reference. Then you could probably do it as a uh, reference. Oh, yeah. But can you pass two parameters? In? A method reference yes. doesn't matter the number okay. of parameters as long as it matches itself. Yeah, it has to match. So, anyway, I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, Damn it, Jim. Damn it, Jim. Okay, so let's look at, um, let's start taking a look at, at streams. So what this code is, is pretty simple. Again, we have just an array of uh, integers, or a list. And we're just trying to figure out what the minimum number is. Well, more specifically, um, we grab the even numbers, uh, I print them out, then we square them, square the even numbers and try to, min try to find the minimum of the squared integers. Right, so it's going to find 10, square it, and that'll be 100. Is that a minimum? Yes, because it's less than max value, integer that max value. Then it says 4, is it even? Yes, let's square it. 16, is that less than 100? Yes, okay, and so on. So that's what basically this min function does. So it's going to just run through this code here real quick. There's a reason I'm doing it in such a odd way. Um, the minimum is 16, right? Because it's four squared and it's even before it was squared. Yeah. Okay. So what we're doing as developers is we are controlling we are controlling the flow, right? And the way we've written this, it can only ever be done in a sequential manner, right? The way we've written. So let's maybe take a look at this from a different angle. So I take my notes. Just want to make sure I do it all in the right order. Then we do it 
from an internal iteration perspective. So now what we're starting to do is, oh, that's the fly one to use though. Right, sorry. doing is we're using what's called the streams API that's it internally a lot like an iterator and what it's going to do basically is pump this list of integers through a pipeline of operations right so what we're going to do is provide it those operations the first one is that we're going to filter what we're saying here is this is where lambda expressions come in handy is only give us even numbers. So anything that passes this filter is now an even number. It goes on to the next step, or the next filter, which is a map. A map basically takes the input and does some kind of transform on it and returns the same data type. Right? And you could also map to, you can actually convert um, to, in, uh, to, to doubles and, and so on if you want to. Uh, so you can switch data types, but in this example, it's just going to take an integer, and in this case, it's going to just return i times i. And what I'm doing here is I'm also printing out i times i, kind of like I did before in that block of code. And this just shows you that even though I'm, I'm doing a map operation where I'm returning a different number, I'm, I'm doing that operation, I can also execute other code, right? It's a lambda expression. I'm, I'm passing in a function that's just a block of code. In this case, the first statement is the printout the squared value, and the second is to uh, return it. Now what's interesting is, if you look at the implementation behind the streams, nothing's been executed yet, right? It's actually just setting up the pipeline. And these are what are called intermediate operations. And then you'll eventually hit what's called a terminal operation, something that gives, uh, that's gonna kick off um, the execution of the stream. In this case, it's the min function. And min actually gets, uh, finds the minimum number. And you remember that, that function that I had that compared uh, two strings, right? And there's actually a string colon colon compare. I think we could have passed that in. Someone was, was talking about, uh, is there a method, a method reference for strings, like that get last name? There is, there is one for strings, just like there is here for integers. And we're going to just pass in a method reference to the integer compare function. And same thing. if the first, or if integer two is less than integer one, it returns a negative one, and then the positive one, if it's greater, is zero if they're equal. So integer colon colon compare. And at this point, what we should have is the minimum of the squares of the even numbers done as a string. Now what's interesting is that we haven't really s stated how we're going about getting this, uh, getting this um, this minimum number from, oh, we're telling it what we want, if you look at this, as opposed to how we're going to get it. This is much more of the how, because we're, we're in control of, of how we get this number. What we're really trying to say here is, let's hand over to the actual streams framework how this stuff gets done. We're just telling them what we want. We want the even numbers. We want to um, then map uh, map it to a square, and then we want to get the minimum value. What's nice about this is if I wanted to, and this gets into, you know, imagine if this is an array or list of a million numbers, right? Then I can turn this into a parallel stream. Parallel. <laughs> there we go. And then it's going to do this um, across uh, a thread, uh, multiple threads. And all of a sudden, if you look at the problem this way, it becomes a lot more powerful than the way that we used to do it, right? Now, to switch gears just a little bit, usually the, the question I get when I say parallel stream, they say, okay, where are these threads coming from? Um, there is a default fork join thread pool that's created behind the scenes. And all the code that's executed and using parallel streams are done with this default fork join thread pool. And the default is the same number of, there's one thread per core on your system. So in this case, I got eight 
cores, and so there's a four join pool of eight threads. And there's a way to overwrite that. There's like a property, you know, dash d, or the java.util.concurrent.forkjoinpool.whatever, that number of, of threads that you want to have in that pool. Um, so that actually gets really interesting, doesn't it? Quick that, question. Yes. So does this whole thing, is it lazy, lazily evaluated, or it, is it evaluated right? <laughs> it is lazily evaluated. So one of the things I was mentioned is, is that it's not going to process all the integers with this filter, get it back a list, then process all of these, then get back a list. It's actually doing it uh, lazily. So you define, that's where it gets into the inter intermediate versus the terminal operations. All the inter interim ones are just setting up the pipeline. Then it'll, it's an interval under the, uh, under the uh, covers, and in this case it's actually a parallel one called a splitterator. Um, but if you think of it just an iterator, what it's going to do is it's going to get the first one, pass it through the filter, pass it through the map, right, um, and, and so on. And if you look at these, parallel stream re returns, uh, I think it's just a stream object, stream. Filter, because these are all pipeline, if you look at filter, it's going to um, execute some logic, return a stream. Right, so it's, it's a lot like if you think about input streams and output streams, right, you can, you know, concatenate these things, um, you know, eventually if you want to do a, you know, a buffer. Um, you can do the same thing here with these inter intermediate operations. But it's not actually executed until you hit a, a final operation. And that's one of the optimizations it makes. It is a final operation one that does not return a stream? Um, a final operation, I don't know if it's specifically does not return a stream but it returns a concrete value. I guess is, is um, uh, a good way of saying it. it. It can be an integer like we have in this case. Actually, it's an optional. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, or it could be another list of things. Um, so in this case, I'm, I'm getting down to, I'm reducing it down to one value, but I could also reduce it down to a list of things. If I wanted to say, just give me back a list of all the even numbers, I could actually collect them into a list. Okay. So, so min is a terminal value, right? It's not get. It, it actually gets evaluated at min and not, not when you actually do correct get. Correct. correct. <coughs> and what's actually interesting is I can actually do this, and I can say, well, you know, maybe I want the filters to happen uh, sequentially, but then I want the maps mm. to happen. Parallel, parallel. Why am I having such a hard time? There we go. I, and I want uh, the map to happen in parallel, right? So there's some interesting things, because everything just returns a stream, right? All right. What, what are some rough guidelines, maybe, in terms of list size, and what you would want to parallelize versus not? Yeah, there's actually, where did I read this at? Was it the server side, or? Someone wrote a um, blog post that basically said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, know, know your context. So the example that this person gave was something like this. I think it was like a hundred thousand objects in, in, uh, in, in an array. And then they stuck that in the context of a web app where you got ten threads hitting it. In that case, there was so much thread contention going on, it was actually worse than if they had just did it all sequentially. So just because you can parallelize it doesn't mean you're automatically going to get faster code. Right. So you still have to know the context that you're doing these things in. Is there any way to... But it sure makes a great demo. <laughs> <laughs> to set a property and then choose a runtime whether you're going to do it in parallel or not? Is there a way at runtime? Well, yeah, because, you know, you could um, say, for instance, uh, stream of integer uh, s. And then you, you could say, uh, I'm sure I'm doing something wrong here. Well, it's pretend to code, right? Uh, if some value greater or um, uh, uh, is greater than 10, some conditional, whatever the conditional is, then I could say uh, uh, execute, uh, then, well, then, then I can assign a stream, oops, s equals uh, list.parallelstream. 
right? So you can actually uh, uh, you, you can actually uh, do it that way, right? And, th and there may be other ways that th that you can do it, but basically you can write your own conditional logic to do it. I've also seen people try, or an example where they took a fork jet a fork join pool, and then they would say dot submit, and then they would pass in a lambda expression or or um, submit a task that actually executes this code, and it'll execute in the context of that fork join pool. Right, so people have been trying to find ways around it, um, but I just kind of ran out of time to investigate it too deeply. So there are some options um, for how you can do it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so that's an internal iteration example. Here's a similar example. Where, oh, sorry, I forgot to talk about optional. Optional looks to be this new type that they want to return or use within their libraries instead of returning null if there's, you know, no valid result. Because they wanted to get away from the dreaded null pointer exception, basically, right? And so what they do, and, and you, you'll see an example, um, actually, I could maybe even do it here. Um, if I, I could theoretically, well, let, let's run this code. I don't think we actually ever ran this code. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, 16 in this case, and uh, all the squared values. So if you make the two on line 25 at 28 or something. What if I make them all odd numbers? That's the example that I was going to use. What would the value be, right? Um, it could return a null if there's a null set. Theoretically, right? Um, so the idea here is if I actually run this code now, uh, no such element exception. I'm trying to think about this. No, it's the min that's causing me problems. Isn't it the old get that's causing problems? Yeah. Oh. No, uh, no, because, oh, oh, that's right. Because okay. Be a none, right? Yeah, yeah, so let's do it this way. Let's leave this code there. Um, what I'm thinking of is there's actually, you could say, oh, maybe I have it over here. That kind of helps. Okay, here? No. I, I have, there's an or, um, uh, where is it? Is it called get all else or something? Yeah. You, you can say in, if, if, if the optional, if, if it has a value, print it out. If not, then just print. Um, no even number. So optional is, is this class that may have a value or may not have a value. And you, and you can test if it has a value. So which is like right a future. Here. So I kind of got ahead of myself when I talked about that. So is, that is that really a savings over <laughs> checking out people? <laughs> 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 so so um, <laughs> well, if a lot of people don't check for null in the first place, when they get that other it's no yeah, different, right? Yeah, without checking. Yeah, you know what I mean, not what I say. <laughs> <laughs> like other languages have an optional type, that, but it doesn't throw an error, it just doesn't give you an answer. Yeah, so I'm trying to think what, yeah, okay, so what actually caused this error? See, this is all being recorded too, which is not good. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> I can take it, I can take it. All right, all right so what happens if I actually try and, uh, you're amongst friends. Yeah. yeah. Just pray to oh. read so let's see what's putting out this code here. Uh, no such element exception, no value present. Yeah, that, yeah, that's an optional, so. Um, at least you don't have a null point. Yeah, at least you don't have a null point. We have 15 years or more experience dealing with null points. Is it? We understand. This is new. Okay, well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but doesn't this give us a slightly more informative message? Like, maybe not a lot, but a little? Yeah, well, I meant to show you that over here, uh, which is how it's intended to, uh, how it's intended to be used. Because you never know what the, what the result is going to be. But, uh, but the point is, if, you, if you're saying o.get, as opposed to just using the, the result of, 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 a, of a variable, and that variable is done here, at least you have to put some thought into, into it. And so hopefully you're smart enough to now, which I wasn't, um, use uh, is present. What's it print out if you uh, just do plus n and there's no value? 
Sorry, if I do what? So instead of doing the get, oh, just in. the plus and the double okay. value sign. Uh, that's the thing. That's the thing. So if I go back, where is it? You mean what does it follow? Two straight yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, is it for the left? I'm trying to find the, the right one where uh, I, I need. Okay, up there. So you can do O dot or else. Yeah, you can do, do O or, dot, uh, or else. Which basically it says if it's null, then do something else, right? Yeah. yeah. So what's it going to do here? It's just going to print out the value of O. Oops, should be an object now. Oh, it's just going to give you the object now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now maybe it's not. Stick it in the number. Okay. No. No. Yeah. What kind of object is option? It's just a base class. It's not a meter. Sorry? It's not a meter. No. Okay, let's do. It's a slide. But it has yeah. some logic. Yep. It's either you have a value or it doesn't. So, yep, of type T. So there's so a, a Java type future that yeah, basically that waits to see if something's arrived. It's the, kind of sort of like that. The two print lines for the two string has to have some mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, run this. Okay, yeah, yeah. So now it has a value. It wants over to print. Optional. The value of four. All right. Yeah. Four, four. Mm -hmm. So. Then it will. This is similar to the last example that used integers. Uh, or I apologize, that, re that um, collapsed it down to a single value, um, that being uh, a single minimum value, an integer. In this case, what we're going to do is, is we're going to collect those values to a list, to another list of integers. So the goal in this case isn't to find what the minimum is, it's just to find what all the square of the even numbers are and return that list of squared even numbers. And what's interesting is, is what you're seeing is this is the source list, this is the destination list, and they're actually going to be different. Because what these are doing is, is that we're iterating over a list but we're not uh, mutating the list, the, uh, the source list. Okay, so if I actually code. So you'll see here that this is just the list of the squared integers. And then this is the, the, the source list. And then, then this is the squared integers. Now so for something that's really weird, I thought, and it took me a while to get my my um, I actually had to talk to one of the engineers to fully understand this, um, or to make sure I understood it properly. I think what I want to do here. Again, this is my last chug, all the edits I made. So what we have is, again, a list of integers. And I'm doing that same comparison as I did before, except this time I'm passing it in just as an inner class, right? I'm defining. Um, the, the uh, compare method myself. And the reason I did this is because I wanted you to see that this is the types that we're dealing with. This is a functional interface, and the abstract method returns an int and takes two ints as a uh, parameter. Well, more specifically, if you look at compare, it's going to be, uh, it has a type and takes um, two parameters that, that, that are of the same type. In this case, it's, it's, it's the integer. So it, it takes a type, uh, uh, two types, it returns negative, uh, again, negative one, positive one, or a zero. But the two types are, uh, that are being passed in are the same. So 
Um, there's multiple ways of, of defining this. First is with an inner class. Another is we can implement it as a lambda. Um, in this case, we're using integer colon colon compare. I thought it's kind of great, maybe hard to see in the back. But this is what I thought I'd try. Okay, so let's try something different. So I wonder if I created my own, interfa inter my own interface that takes an integer and passes into integers. It's called compare. But what's interesting is that the type of this interface isn't comparator, it's my interface, right? I just made one up. And then I pass that in. Okay. So I wanted, I wanted to see what the uh, result would be. It worked, right? And you think, now wait a second. I just passed in something of type my interface. But you passed it in as a method reference, I thought. Yes. Yes, I passed it as a method reference. So what's actually going on here is my interface is, first of all, well, let's, let, let's look at a couple of things. First, uh, sorry. So it's taking comparator. A comparator is a functional interface, right? Which means it has one abstract method. And what my interface is, is it's an interface that has one abstract method. It's a functional interface. I didn't define it as one, but it is. Remember, defining add functional interface is optional, just like add override is, right? Wait, it's a static method. Though. Yeah, it's not an abstract method. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, but it's still not oh. abstract. You have an implementation. I have an implementation. Let me think about this. <laughs> All you need is one method. It doesn't even need to be abstract. It's, it's it doesn't even... Well, no, it does matter. Um, is it because... As long as it's not ambiguous, let's say. Yeah, let me think about this. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot why I did it this way. Hold on. Default or implemented or not or default. This is the only choice for the compiler. Did it? Can I find simple compare integer, integer, and build method reference? Oh. Okay. Well, let's go back to the way it was for a second. So I was trying to understand this. Um, and so I passed it, so I was running this by one of the engineers, and, and he basically said, okay, so you have this method that has the t same method structure as what the functional interface is expecting. It, it's a type taking two of the same type, and returning an integer in this case, and it's returning an integer. Does it auto box though? Yeah, it's going to auto box the auto box the x and the y the integer. Okay. So what that basically means is that the method signature. I got to think about the static part, um, but the method signature of this compare is the same as what that functional interface is expecting. So the compiler matches them up, and he basically says once developers understand method references, they'll really understand uh, the functional programming approach in Java, right? So that's kind of from a functional perspective, um, Lambda and, and streams, I guess, uh, especially Lambda, so that's kind of the, the best thing I, I could probably leave is, once you fully understand uh, the method references, which obviously I don't here, <laughs> um, then, then you really understand functional programming in, in, in Java. Right, but it, to me it was just really weird that I'm passing into my interface and the thing expects a comparator, right? It's like, it doesn't make sense, but the compiler is actually comparing the functional method to what you're passing in, the functional method that you're passing in. So. Can you make that default? 
you have to have an implementation to create an object that extends the interface for the, uh, for the functional pointer to work? Sorry, do I have to have a... So if that's default rather than static, right? I would think that that means that you have to have an, an, a concrete implementation, you know, an object that implements that interface. But this is no, yeah, this is no longer a functional interface, which is weird, right? But, but static isn't either. Well, but, okay. static in classes means that you don't have to have an object instance right, 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 of right, right, class right. in order to use it. So I would infer that it's the same with the interfaces. Whereas default, would, I would think, would mean something different. Right, right. Unless it means it's... Yes, because you have to have an implementation. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, default won't work. But what if you had an instance of an object that implemented that? Okay, so if we have default, like that, we have class uh, Z. We didn't want to punt. It's because <laughs> <laughs> A. Damn it, Jim. All right. The other reason, uh, there's a couple of other things I wanted to cover. And the method could have been declared as. Okay, it's 8:45. Cover a bit about optional. Uh, I mentioned there's some predefined um, functions, some functional interfaces, I should say. Um, Predicate. In fact, when you looked at the filter where I was basically saying is an even number, that is uh, that filter method actually takes as a parameter a predicate, which basically returns a boolean and pass uh, takes the input of some type t. So it takes a t, you do whatever logic on what that t type is and have to return a true or false. Right? Consumer, you saw, it just applies an action. Um, to a uh, to a type being passed in and and so on. There's a bunch more. Uh, you can now do annotations on Java types. So annotations can currently um, only be used on type declarations in in Java. And what you could do now is use annotations um, around uh, or uh, on classes, methods, variables, um, etc. And there's actually a few pluggable type checkers out there that at compile time will actually do some compile time checking leveraging these annotations, right? Whereas in the past, I think you're only able to apply these annotations, um, again, at the, uh, um, on type declarations, now you can use them on uh, other aspects as well. And so if you go watch, there's a metadata um, video on that Java SE8 launch, and they go into this um, in a lot more detail. This is an area I'm not too comfortable with. Um, but one thing they did add is also repeating annotations. So if you think about JPA, any JPA programmers here, right? If you if you have a named query um, or a bunch of named queries, you have to have a container type, right? That contains those named queries. Well, what they're saying is. Um, with repeatable annotations, you don't have to have that anymore. Um, the, the thing is that the library has to support that. So there's a new annotation called re repeatable. So the, you, there's still a container type um, that li the library owner will have to create. But when you actually do repeatable annotations, um, it'll actually be done in the background um, by the compiler. So you don't have to have it in your code anymore. So now you can say at inquiry, at inquiry, at inquiry not have to have that container type. Um, that's just an example. Uh, you can parallel array sorting. Um, th this is, the interesting data point here is they want an anticipated minimum improvement over, uh, of 30, 30%, excuse me, uh, <laughs> of 30% over a sequential sort when you have two cores, right? That was, um, that was the goal. So you saw, for example, I had a parallel stream. Um, you saw that I, I also called sort um, in, in one of the examples. It's also a parallel sort. Now, th what this says, yeah, uh, dual core system, right? 30% improvement on a dual core system. 
there's a new set of date and time APIs. So there's a class called local time, local <coughs> date, local date time, clock. And the idea is they have multiple date types now that are intended to address different use cases. Um, and it's my understanding they also handle time zones a little bit better. Um, but I haven't used any state time APIs yet. Base64 encoding and decoding. So we've always had them, but they were in private APIs. Um, now they're part of public APIs. And this is actually an interesting point because the JDK team is also talking to us, us meaning product teams, in, in my case, Glassfish uh, you know, and uh, Eclipse Link Top Link. And they're basically saying, please remove all calls to private APIs. And they really want us to stop using private APIs because it, it causes them headaches. Um, it, it increases the surface area that they have to deal with when, for example, doing security issues and so on, and security testing, among other things. So they really want um, product teams to stop using these private APIs. So and it, it's interesting because in some cases, there are already alternates in the, in the GDK. In some cases, there weren't, and so what you see here, they're actually taking something that was private and making it public. And it'll be curious to see what they do going forward. And that should have been public years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're getting rid of the private ones, then? No, 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 not, uh, <laughs> don't read too much into that. Um, okay. well, so you were never supposed to rely on that. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. yeah. By default, anything that's not in the Java and Java X right top level packages is good luck, right. right? And now it's it's to the point where they're starting to kind of guide people toward the right answer, which is you know don't use private APIs. In this case, they're providing um, public API to replace them. So it's always a good idea. All right, uh, Nashorn JavaScript engine. Anyone play with Nashorn at all? Okay, I have some pretty cool examples I'll, I'll show you here real quick. Uh, the Nashorn JavaScript in, engine is basically a JavaScript engine that replaces Rhino in earlier versions and it's a lot faster. Um, uses Invoke Dynamic um, and, uh, as well as some additional optimizations to make it faster than Rhino. Uh, there's no more Perm gen in JDK. <laughs> Woo. So uh, there is a flag, though. So, so basically, it's it's all dynamically allocated, right? And so what it will do is offer you a chance to set a maximum size, still, right? Um, but by default, there is no limit, and you know it'll just work. Um, no more tuning for that. And another interesting experimental feature, I thought, um, class data sharing across processes. So the idea is if you're trying to run Java-based applications in a cloud environment, now they can share some of the same uh, code. Things like JIT code potentially as well. So this is, uh, you know, that'll reduce the memory footprint, for example, if it having multiple JDKs on the same system. And so, again, it's, it's, it's experimental. Uh, Multi-step optimization, so if you're you know, familiar with the way uh, the JDK basically optimized. There was, of course, there was the interpreter, then there was the client compiler and the server compiler, and now they basically combine them. And, and the idea is you'll get a, a fast initial set of compila uh, compilation, and uh, that gets applications started faster. And then, again, once you hit a, a certain number of iterations, it'll do a higher level of optimization. So, and this is enabled by default. So it doesn't take so long to start up. Um, applications, right? Uh, this is just an example. I'm not sure where this example came from, so I can't explain it too much, but it looks really good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they're basically taking, I don't know which application server, uh, but they're taking a, an application, deploying it to the server, and, and basically they have the server running with the client compiler um, and the server compiler. And you can think about this really as kind of a dev time operation where you're, where you're trying to apps um, in an iterative kind of fashion. And this just gives you an example of, uh, if you look at the gray, they're using the server compiler, about how long it used to take. And now with the tiered compiler, um, the applications uh, actually are, are faster to deploy. 
deploy and run. The, the thing that gets me up about this one is there's no run step here, it's just deployment. So, but anyway, uh, invoke dynamic. Um, I think the point I wanted to show here is this invoke dynamic was added in JDK 7, and they actually use it to implement uh, lambdas, and it's also used to implement uh, the NAS horn engine. The NAS horn JavaScript engine. If you look, uh, the gray is the old JDK 7 Rhino implementation of JavaScript, and JDK 8 is NAS Horn. And you can see they get, uh, they're showing you the speed up on the, uh, the Y axis, and you can see using uh, you know, various algorithms that you get potentially significant uh, performance increase using NAS Horn over the older Rhino. And they have a, a JDK update coming that will again double the performance of a couple of these. Um, I, I don't know which ones, um, I might need to talk to engineers about it. All right, mission control. How many of you know about mission control in the JDK? Do you guys use, okay, awesome. Uh, do you guys use uh, Visual VM or J Console? Yeah. So basically, mission control ships with the JDK, I think starting JDK 7 U40 and above. And mission control is basically um, kind of like a Visual VM, but it ships with uh, every JDK. So you can um, get uh, a quick dashboard view of what's happening with the JVM. You can browse them beans. Uh, I think you can set triggers uh, that will fire when certain things happen and so on. Okay. So that's kind of a, um, a nice um, feature. There's also, for commercial customers, something called uh, Flight Recorder. And what Flight Recorder does, well, typically if you think about things like Visual VM or Mission Control here, it gives you a snapshot of what things are. And what Flight Recorder does is it's a circular buffer, um, or a fixed time, you know, if you want to continuously run, or a fixed time look at the VM and everything that's happening over that period of time. So it tracks all the object allocations, all the VM garbage collections, and so on. What you can do is, is over time, or you can do a dump of all of that. When, when you have a problem, and then you go back and you look at that, and you try and uh, do a root cause analysis. Whereas if you look at Visual VM, it kind of gives you averages over time and, and so on. Whereas Flight Recorder gives you what things looked at at a point in time, right? And you can go forward and backward in time until you find what your issue is. All right. JavaFX. Anyone here do, do JavaFX development? A couple. Uh, they added a new theme called uh, Modena. And I guess it, it's, uh, I'm not a Java X, uh, FX developer, um, so I won't be able to give you a lot of good uh, information on it in detail. But there's, again, if you go to the Java 8 launch page, there's a, quite a good um, field out and some of the new features. But there's a new style sheet. It, if you pick kind of this default um, uh, color, then it'll, it'll kind of wrap all the other colors around it with a very similar um, uh, theme where, where colors don't clash too much. So it's actually kind of interesting. It's very dynamic in that sense. Uh, improvements to full screen mode. Um, this is something I want to show here. Uh, printing support. So now you can print from JavaFX apps. Print your uh, either either the entire screen or portions of the screen, which is really nice. Uh, or I shouldn't say screen of your app, right? Maybe the screen as well, but portions of your app, um, certain panels, for instance, or, or the entire. There's some new controls. There's a, a, a new date picker that supports the new date time API, uh, a new tree table view control, um, touch support uh, for embedded devices. So JavaFX runs on uh, embedded devices. It runs on Android apps, or sorry, Android, um, iOS. I don't know what Windows status is off the top of my head, um, as well as desktops. So they have it running on a, a Raspberry Pi. People are running kiosks, for example. Uh, 3D support with the ability to, to do textures across solids and lighting and cameras and all that kind of stuff. Something else that's new is what's called compact profile. So what we're typically used to is a full JRE. And then if you want to go smaller than, than that, as a developer, you would have to go to J2ME, right, or Java ME, the micro edition to get it down to, to smaller profiles. And what they've done is realize that you want, that developers want 
a more traditional Java development experience um, with the common set of APIs they already use. But what they do is they kind of prune off the standard set of APIs as you go to a smaller and smaller profile, right? So the Compact One profile is 11 megabytes, and this is the migration path for um, the CDC ME profile. It basically includes you know Java plus logging and SSL. And then if you go to Compact Two, uh, it adds in XML, JDBC, and RMI. And if you go to Compact Three, it adds in uh, GMX uh, naming. I think that's the uh, um, the LDAP and, and cause naming and GMDI stuff. Uh, more security and, and compiler support. Um, the ability to call the, the, call the compiler from your code. Then you got the full JRE. Right, so the idea is now you can take your um, uh, a JRE and run it on top of a set-top box or, or, or a gateway device that you're creating, a home gateway, for instance, and, and pick the right profile based on the resources you have for the device. I think eventually the, the there's still uh, Java Micro Edition, and if you go look at again the, the launch page, you'll see lots of talks about Java Micro Edition and the things they're doing there. But at some point, it, it may all start to kind of work together a little bit closer, and you can kind of see that happen with the CDC, um, basically migrating over to Compact One profile. Uh, basically, the Java SE public update schedule. So what I wanted to, to show here is that JDK 7 uh, GA'd in July of 2011, uh, and March of 2014 is the end of public updates. So they basically um, announced to people, hey, you, you basically have about a year before we stop shipping updates to JDK 7. That includes security fixes, by the way. Um, and then the last release will basically be April of 2015, some, somewhere around that time frame. And then basically, you either have to go to commercial support of the Oracle JDK, or you just move on to JDK 8, right? And then this is the JDK 8 um, schedule. The one thing I did want to show you real quick um, was, My window. So what I thought I'd do is show you uh, the, the NAS one engine. What's kind of neat, neat about it is you can run just by calling uh, JJS space some JavaScript name, and it'll just execute JavaScript. But an interesting feature is that you can actually use it in scripting mode, just like you would any other shell, like you know Bash, or if you run awk and as, as a command interpreter and so on. So you can do that with the JavaScript engine as well. So for instance, if you want to take all the output of a file, in this case, it's the source code of this file itself, um, you, you can use backticks, right? Just like you would in uh, you know, executing a bash command. Uh, you can then just use JavaScript to, to split the output of each line in, in, into an array of lines. You can reference environmental variables from within your JavaScript. In this case, it's dollar sign, uh, you know, env in the current directory, and then it'll go out and um, print this um, file contents out. So if I run readout.js, it'll actually print readout.js as well as the current working directory. So here's the working current directory, and just print out the contents, the contents of a file. Right, so basically what we're showing is that you can use JavaScript now just to run, you know, um, as a command shell. Whereas in the past you might use Augur Pro or something, now you can also use JavaScript. One other interesting thing is because this is running on the JVM, you can also call Java code. And in this case, I'm mixing uh, Java code, I'm using a linked list. Uh, so basically I instantiate um, uh, a linked list class, create a new instance of it, and then add all the output lines to the list. I'm actually <coughs> calling the linked list add function. Okay, so I can now intermix my Java code. So the example here is if you have like existing Java code that you want to use within JavaScript, you can actually do it on top of the JVM. Right, so if we were actually run this. Uh, it just, again, does basically the same thing, but it used uh, Java linked lists, right? Now what's actually really interesting 
is because this is running on top of Java in the JVM, typically you think that JavaScript is single threaded, right? But when it's running in uh, a JVM, in this case I'm actually calling lambdas, or sorry, the uh, Java Streams APIs, calling parallel stream uh, to show that you can actually do some multi threading. Um, for filter, I'm actually, instead of passing a Java Lambda expression, I'm just passing a JavaScript function. And, and so on. So I'm mixing and matching JavaScript with Java code, in this case lambdas, right? And where this um, also gets interesting is I can actually, if I want to, do something like uh, var thread equals java.ling.thread. And then I can basically pull on thread from JavaScript, right? Which you can't do in JavaScript. So I thought I'd just show that to you real quick. Um, can you add your own classes to the class path so you can yeah. try out? Oh yeah, the, the idea, the, the intent is that you can, if you've already got libraries that you want to invoke right. from JavaScript, yeah, you, you can call into those. Now, we actually, so the other project I'm responsible, responsible for is Avatar, which basically layers a node runtime on top of the JVM, so you can run node code. And then on top of that, it layers on a higher level um, set of libraries. Sorry, a higher level set of services, mm -hmm. so that you can easily create RESTful services, mm -hmm. um, SSE, service end event services, and so on. And you can actually write JavaScript code um, using the node model, node programming model, instead of using the V8 engine. But then you can call into, call into your Java libraries natively, just like we did here. Right? So it's actually kind of neat. So at, at that, from that perspective, I guess I'll, I'll end it here. Uh, it's about 9 o'clock anyway. So. All right. Uh, thanks. Stumped the monkey like five times tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our drawing is up. I'm going to have John draw three lucky winners. Are there any more flyers? Last chance, okay? So let's go ahead and draw one. Okay, just one. Yeah, All right. Off the number. Off the number. The last three digits are 069. Must be present. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> My right, I'm almost done. Sorry. Take it home with you. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, guys. How you doing, Amy?